Arrows as well. Yeah, I'm looking for. Huh. There we go. All right. And I'm not going to claim to have any mental health, but I told Gavin we're going to talk about things that we see on campus. What do I see going on here? Yes, there is schizophrenia. Don't see a lot of that occasionally. There is bipolar. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that, but that is there. I will be alluding to that. But intertwined in all of this stuff, we're going to talk about self-care. How do you take care of you? How do you take care of yourself? How do you take care of your brothers? Because that's important as well. Or it may even be how do you take care of your date? Objectives. I'm old school. I just soon sit up for the chair by here and talk to y'all, but we got to do all this academia, right? We're in college. We're going to talk about stress. That's, that's the beginning of all of this. We're talking about strategies to manage stress. How do you do it? What do you do? The best thing is not to go drink a beer if you're under stress. We'll talk about that. We're going to talk about depression, signs and symptoms. We're going to look at anxiety disorders, substance abuse disorders, and suicide. And that's, that's the goal. To be honest with you, when I do uh, substance abuse, I'm having to condense two hours down to about 10 or 15 minutes. Yeah. Same thing with uh, 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 depression and anxiety. So we're going to rock and roll. But I'll always. Where's that, where's that little cursor? I'm going to use the keyboard arrows if you can Okay, a college student, so are you all under stress? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, sure you oh, are. Yeah. Everybody is. 70% of people have, so have great stress at least once a week. So we're going to talk about what are some of the stressors. We kind of know what they are, but let's look at them. Expectations. And Gavin has this, by the way. Y'all don't need it for house stuff. What do we mean by expectations? Those are external expectations. What do our parents expect of us? What do our professors expect of us? And just as importantly as what do I expect of me? That's critical and often left out of the thing. Stress comes from change. Yes, sir. Um, so oftentimes I find, like in a social setting, um, if you're kind of expected, uh, like, an unwritten rule is like, you're supposed to stay in the room, or like, do whatever the room is doing. So when you walk out of the room, I've noticed a lot of times that people will be very confused and very like, kind of attacking about why are you leaving, what's going on, and so on. Well, that, that's gonna get into social anxiety, and we're right. gonna talk about that. Uh, but change, leaving home. Of course, y'all are probably all up, juniors, seniors, sophomores, freshmen. Yeah. Well, leaving home's a change. We'll talk about that. Even good change brings about stress, okay? Academic demands. You can read this, transitions, various levels of social support. Some days you may feel like you've got all kind of support in life. Other days it sucks and you don't have a bit. It's still there, but we're stressed and we don't see it. Uh, pressure to perform. Uh, academically, if you're athletes or if you're in the band, there's pressures to perform, to do right. Finances, everybody today seems to have some financial stress. You know, social stressors, what you were talking about, I'll leave the room, I'll come back, but we'll get into that in more detail in a minute. But we have to balance all of this. Now balance has been a key word in the mental health field for a long time. And we have to balance these but be careful about balances, because if you balance too much, you don't stand up for anything. Okay? What is stress? It's natural. It's a fight or flight response. We get the adrenaline rush. Our body's ready to what? Fight or run. Now, blood sugar goes up, the hormones go up, all of this happens. Now, if I'm having a normal stressful day, can I always fight? No. Can I always run away? No. So that's where the stress becomes a real issue. 
because our genetic code says you fight or fly, right? But we can't do it, so it kind of builds. And that's where the anxiety comes in and the stress disorders come in. How do you cope with that one today? What about tomorrow? How do you cope with that one today? Useful and necessary. If you didn't have stress, you wouldn't study for that exam. If you didn't have stress, you wouldn't prepare if you're an athlete or a band or given a talk. Did I prepare? Yes. Do I over prepare? Yes. I've done it for longer than y'all have been alive, but that's my stress and what I choose to do. Sustained uh, stress, it takes a toll. It wears us out. And if you'll take a minute and think back, the last time you had a cold or the flu, I'm going to suggest that a week or two prior to that, you probably were in a lot of stress. Not every time, but often. It wears our immune system down, especially when it's sustained. And we do know that stress can contribute to the disease process. Cardiovascular, gastrointestinal, uh, neurological, what are some signs? We can say, oh, I feel stress. What the hell does that mean? What does it mean? Well, one thing keep in mind, it's going to be something for you that I may not be stressed about. So it's very individual, even though we all got it. Pressure, fatigue, you get stressed, you're going to get wore out. If you don't, deal with it. Yes, sir. So I noticed that a couple of days ago, I, I didn't have anything to do that day, and I really didn't do anything that day, but the whole day, while I was kind of, um, you know, not doing anything, it's, it's kind of a time of rest, but I was so stressed that mm -hmm. I could not calm down. I yeah. was just, the whole day was high water. It was change, it was different. You were so used to doing mm -hmm. so I was supposed to be doing. Yeah. Our society has a great deal of trouble relaxing and winding down. Most of us in this room would probably <coughs> dread <coughs> that we had two days of absolutely nothing to do. Mm -hmm. Excessive worry, impaired memory, illness, palpitations. Appetite's a big thing. When we talk about stress slash anxiety, we can't leave depression out. Okay? So, those are some of the signs of stress, and we all have them. Keep in mind, these aren't good and bad. They just are. And how we deal with them uh, is, is what's critical. I'm going to pass this out. It takes a few minutes. I'm going to let you just look at it. Uh, we're not going to do the whole thing. That's not enough to let me know. Uh, it just has to do with balance. Whatever's left over, we put back down here. It's kind of balance and stress. And we use this in classes. We use this therapeutically. Look closely. It's got six areas of your life. The physical being, the emotional being, I believe are all spiritual beings. How we express that is very different. Uh, social, emotional, and environmental. So I want you to take a minute, look on page two, flip it over, and take a minute and think about what are these things that you do or don't do. We're not going to draw the whole thing out like the one we would ask us to do. Uh, I want you to think about it. Do you eat regularly? That's important. Do you eat healthy foods? Hell no, you're in college. <laughs> you know, I, I get it, but do the best you can. When I was in college, I actually had a roommate hospitalized for malnutrition. <laughs> you know, so I, I get it. Okay, no, that's enough one. Huh? What? No, 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 no. Do you get enough sleep? Ah, interesting. Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. When I'm asking people about sleep, I'm not wondering, caring, caring that much about how many hours you get. You may do five with six hours. You may need eight. He may need ten. 
It's all, like I said a while ago, it's all individual. Now, in the realm of sleep, I think I need to like, like tighten up the schedule rather than the hours. Yeah. Like I need to wake up at a better time and sleep again for an extra 30 minutes to an hour. Then you make that adjustment. Yeah. But when, when sleep is affected, we have trouble going to sleep or staying asleep. That's, that's what we're looking at. Do you take time off when you need to? Do you take a break? Those are some physical things. Look down at self, mental self-care. Do you pay attention to your inner thoughts? We all got them. Pay attention to them. Do you, do you challenge your intelligence? Not just in the classroom, but out there in the world. Do you take time to reflect on yourself? Just to sit back and say, yeah. I'm doing pretty good, or I need to. Yes, you do, because you wouldn't have said you're going to change sleep habits. Oh, okay. If you didn't do some self reflection. Okay. That makes sense. Um, unplug. Unplug's a big one. How many of you take time to turn off the phone? Yay, good for you. Most of the time, I don't know what, of course, I'm a different generation. Y'all remember that when I'm talking. <laughs> Most, a lot of times, I don't know where mine is. That's okay with me. As long as I don't lose it. My daughter gave it to me and she'd be pissed off. Um, then we're going to look over, keep going on that. I'm trying to. Environmental self care. This, this one's kind of really interesting. People around you, are they supportive or are they toxic? That's your environment. You know, do you do anything? to make the world a better place? Do you recycle? Do you practice nonviolence? What, what do you do to make it better? Do you litter or not litter? This is environmental thing. Emotional. Do you show love for yourself? <coughs> Self-compassion is a big, big deal that most people don't engage in. We're, we're too busy listening to the messages of the past not good enough. You can't do this, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Read something this week, last week, sometimes recently. Treat yourself like a five-year-old would treat you. You're going to get praise. You're going to get adoration, but it's going to come from yourself. Do you let yourself express your emotions? Most of us guys, we have a problem with that. If I were to pass a sheet around and write down your emotions, we're probably, as guys, not going to come up with more than four or five. But there's 30 or more. Okay? But the expressive, other than anger, <laughs> you know, my son just broke his <laughs> finger hitting a golf cart. What kind of stupid shit is that? Excuse my language. That's kind of stupid. The first athlete I saw when I came to work here, was about this big and this big. Huge dude. Anger management. Why? Because he hit a brick wall and broke his arm. <laughs> I, I made sure I knew what the door was. Do um, you find <laughs> things to make yourself laugh? Do you try to decrease your stress? How do y'all decrease your stress? What do you do? do you, how many of you exercise? That's a good stress relief. What do you do by marching? Oh, I guess, yeah. Okay. No, I, although I would have to not ask you to do stress. something else. No, no, uh, how many of us pray or meditate? Meditation is a good thing to do, man. That's right. Because um, it's a good time for reflection and separation. Pardon? It's a good time for reflection and sure separation from your sure. way I'm a big advocate of mindfulness meditation. We have time toward the end. We'll talk about that. Spiritual self-care, reflection, spending time in nature. A lot of literature now about nature baths. Just go out in the forest and just sit there. We're a product of nature. But when we're in these big buildings all day, and you leave this building, you get in your car, and you go to that building, you get in your car, and you go to this other building, et cetera, et cetera, we're out of touch with nature. 
pay attention to nature. Look out for the non-material parts of your life. Because you got it. You got it. Pay attention to inspirational things. Meditate or pray. I love this one. Have an experience of awe. Y'all know what awe is, right? We just go, wow. How many of you have one of those lately? Most of us have. That's where you go. You're going to find that in nature. Wow, look at that sunset. Wow, look at that forest. Look at that tree. Yes, sir. Um, it, it's really hard, I think, in the, like in the modern day to find odd things that are so, like, taken so much for granted because we can find the whole world on our phones. And it's always in the same photo. But that's, it's, always in a, it's always in just a square. You but know, that's not finding the, the world. That's finding an image of the that's world. That's right. Yeah, that's right. You know, so it's hard to like appreciate the real thing. The reality, you know. I've seen students before that come into my office, quote, stressed out, full of anxiety because their boyfriend or girlfriend broke up with them. And this person they had never even met in real life. It was all online. All on the screen there. I'm sorry, folks, but that's just not reality. <laughs> it's important. There's some good things that happen there. How I many of you take time to play? This is self-care. Play around sometimes. Joke around with your friends. Relax. Take breaks at school? Well, yeah, probably a little bit. How many of you say that you have a good support system? People that you can go to. Well, those that don't raise your hands, you can get the hell out because that's what a fraternity is about. Is that support system? And I'm kidding you. I told you how witches are okay? But that's what a fraternity is about. I noticed that my problem with that lately is uh, I just found this out recently is that my support system has been narrowed down to a very small number of people. Mm -hmm. That I, and, and when you blast them with that information, every single time it happens, it will become less and less mm -hmm. receptive. So what we do, we either choose to not blast it with that information yeah. or expand our system. Now what you're going to find is right now your support system is probably as large as it's going to get. So you're going to graduate, you're going to go to a new place, a new town. Some of you will never see each other again no matter how close you think you are. And then you go get old, like me, and all your friends start dying off. So enjoy it, take advantage of it. Do you let other people, this is social self-care, we're gonna blast off that for this one. We all have different aspects of ourselves. Do you let people see those different aspects? In other words, do you let other friends, brothers, uh, partners in life see you sad? Do you let them see you depressed? Do you let them see you happy? Be willing to share those. That takes care of you. What I'm gonna ask you to do is hold on to this and reflect on it sometimes. Look over it. Take a minute, because you may wanna do the exercise, but it's important stuff. <coughs> so, where are we? We balanced our stress, right? We don't have it anymore, right? We got it. This tells you how to do that. We're not, we just talked about it. Anxiety, a big deal. If I had that proverbial dollar or nickel, even for every time I saw a student, and I'm focusing on students now, I've seen people all, all areas of life that came in and said, I've got anxiety. I would have done been retired. But what is it? It's a little bit more than we sometimes think it is. It's common. We all get it sometimes. It's a result of stressful situations. We've talked about stress. Mild anxiety to me is the same thing as stress. It helps us to get things done. It's situational. The anxiety disorder is where our anxiety and stress, I'm going to include those because to me they're interchangeable, 
interfere with our daily life. And that's what we want to avoid. I don't know how well you can see this, but this shows the interaction or the relationship between stress and anxiety. And, and the middle is the commonalities, and these other ones like, okay, stress is usually, usually short term and specific to an event. Man, I got a big test tomorrow, I'm stressed, I got to study. Or I got a big event to go to and I'm stressed, I got to get ready. It's that one event. Whereas anxiety can have that as a trigger or no trigger. Sometimes we, people that have an anxiety disorder, this stuff just comes in and where'd it come from? I don't know. The physiological things, pay attention to that. We can deny all day long that, oh, this, this bothers me or this bothers me. But if my heart's beating regular, if I got a history of gastrointestinal problems, I'm sweating, something's going on, and it's probably anxiety or stress. Fear hits in this area too. Uh, and some emotion. And here I love this. Fear, stress, anxiety, real or perceived imminent threat. Doesn't have to be real to freak us out. Okay? You know, the things that go bump in the dark. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, anxiety usually is the anticipation of a future event. I'm anxious because we're going to fail that test. I'm anxious because my girlfriend's going to break up with me. I'm anxious because, because, because. They overlap but are different. Anxiety is essentially an excessive reaction to a given stimulus. It, it, it causes us to be unable to function, fear, <coughs> dread of things that may happen but don't even exist. There's people that would get severe anxiety, maybe panic attack, if they were told, go give this presentation and get in front of people. That's just the way life is. Now, when we talk about anxiety, too, we would be remiss. I don't know where this is. Some symptoms. Excessive work. Ritualistic behavior is kind of neat. We get rigid. We start doing this because that may happen. We do this to keep that from happening. Real or perceived, okay? Muscle aches and avoidance. I'm so anxious for that test, I'm not going to study it. I'm so anxious to ask this girl out that I just don't do it. I'm, so, I'm tremble, I shake, racing hard. Now, anxiety disorders are different. Stress slash anxiety, normal. We get through it. If it's uh, just stress, well, sometimes we just have to act and it, we, it's done with, it's over. If it becomes a disorder, then it becomes unmanageable without intervention. Okay, without intervention. Any age, most often appears late adolescence or early adulthood. That's true with most mental disorders. Y'all are the prime age to freak out. <laughs> it's true. When I worked on a psychiatric unit, one this young lady stands out to me. She was a straight-A student. She went to Jack State, and she had her first psychotic break. And it was the saddest thing I think I've ever seen. She knew what was going on. She knew what she'd been doing, but she could not control it. She got better and came out with her graduating. Some types of anxiety disorders, agoraphobia. There are people out there that won't step out of their house because it's just too big of a world. You know, that, this is true. Do I see that with students? Not often, occasionally. Uh, anxiety due to a medical condition, yeah. You, you get a football player that breaks an arm, they're anxious, <laughs> and it's a medical condition. Uh, Generalized anxiety disorder is the most thing, GAD, G-A-D, is the most common thing. That's an episode 
uh, of persistent worry about events and activities. Uh, the thing about anxiety, it can happen with depression. So we have, we're, we're challenged to figure that out, which came first. Now, you've heard people say I had a panic attack, right? A panic disorder is a sudden onset of feelings. I'm up here, I'm doing fine giving a presentation. Suddenly, I have these feelings of inadequacy, blah, 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 and I run out of the room. That's a panic attack. A panic attack would be going to a social event, getting in, having a good time, freaking out and leaving. Can't handle it, a panic attack. Social anxiety, also called the social phobia. We fear and avoid social situations. I can't go out with you because I'm afraid to go to the dance. I can't hang out with you because you want to go where there's going to be a lot of people. I'm going to avoid that. And we see that with students a good bit. Um, substance induced anxiety, that's a real deal. This is when people drink or drug too much, and the anxiety is a result of doing that. Or withdrawal, or any toxic substance. Depression, 20% of us are gonna have a depressive episode in our life. That's just what the statistics say. <clears throat> now, depression is not the same thing as sadness. Keep that in mind. A lot of times people, we use these terms interchangeably and real loosely. Oh, I'm depressed. Well, maybe, maybe not. You Maybe you're just sad. Well, you know, we don't know. We gotta talk about that. <clears throat> the symptoms of depression is loss of energy. If y'all ever come see a counselor, somewhere along that thing, that continuum, you're gonna be asked about your energy your energy level. You're gonna be asked about your appetite. I mentioned that before. You're gonna be asked about those things. Changes in appetite, negative view of self, concentration, sleep. That's another thing we wanna ask you about. How's your sleep? Has there been a big change in your sleep pattern? I used to sleep 10 hours, now I'm sleeping four. I used to sleep four, now I'm sleeping 12. That's, that's a big deal. We'll talk a bit more about suicidal thinking, but that is a symptom of depression. Depression, I think we probably see more depression than anxiety. I don't know why. But the, oftentimes they're so mixed. It's what came first. But it might be um, that like anxiety requires that kind of expectation of something, mm -hmm. that, like that high strung feeling of, of fight or flight. Mm -hmm. Whereas depression is kind of the turning off of your system. So you just kind of like get rid of the feeling entirely so that it doesn't bother you. And it's overwhelming. Yeah. The fight or flight is overwhelming. We can't handle it. Warning signs of depression. How do you know if the brother's getting depressed? Well, the first one is hearing or seeing things you don't see or hear. Yes, that happens with depression. We usually think, oh, that's just psychotic. Severe depression, you can do that. Oh, did, did you hear that? Oh, hey, did you see that? Psychosis is another thing. We don't have time, but it's, it's another, another thing. That's clean alcohol and drug use. That is a symptom. If I'm a drinker and I get depressed, chances are I'm going to drink more. We'll talk a little bit about that in substance use in a minute. A history of problems. If you know that this person you're talking to has a history of self-harm, they're probably depressed. And by self-harm, I mean cutter. You know, you know people that cut themselves? Okay. There's probably some depression going on there. No future orientation, why, why bother? Why bother to do anything? This world sucks. And it's not getting any better, so why bother? Well, 
it gets better one person at a time. That's the only way. Wrong in the first place. Like, why do it at all? Mm -hmm. like, like, I'm already failing, so why do it? Exactly. Exactly. Now, I'm going to throw this out. I have a slide on it. Some we use called adjustment disorder. And this is something that happens. The symptoms develop within three months and they dissipate within six months. See that a lot. I'm going to pick on freshmen for a minute. Not you in particular, because I don't know you. But a lot of freshmen will come to school and they're all excited and they're gung ho and they do it. And about November, December, they wonder, what the hell am I doing here? That could be an adjustment disorder with depression. There's also an adjustment disorder with anxiety, with mixed emotional features, but the symptoms cover everything we've talked about here. Okay? Uh, now, my favorite one, oh, let's go this one. Biochemistry, you know, Prozac and SSRIs are very, very, Common, almost too common. I think doctors are probably giving them out like they used to give out value to the 50s. Okay? The SSRIs, guess what? They work, by and large. But fascinating, we're starting to see some research that says maybe depression is more complex than just a dopamine mess up in the brain. Maybe it's more complex than a chemical imbalance. Because for years and years, we still do it. Oh. You're depressed, you have a chemical imbalance. Maybe, maybe not. And there's some novel ways they're treating depression now, because we're not doing it on campus. Psychedelics, ketamine, psilocybin, all of these, the microdosing. Uh, genetics, if my parents, or one of my parents had a major depression disorder, I have a good chance. It's not a cause and effect, I have a good chance. My personality may lead to depression. Uh, medical conditions, there's certain medical conditions that we go that's depression, and trauma. If I have a history of trauma, I may very well be depressed. So, I'm in a psychiatric mental health course right now, and one of the big things that I've kind of noticed and that they're trying to figure out is that when you take SSRIs, coupling that with therapy mm -hmm. actually helps with the depression more than just doing the SSRIs. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think physicians are remiss in saying, okay, here's your some Prozac, bye. It needs a talk therapy too. Totally agree with that, totally. And there's all kind of different talk therapy uh, that, we, that we can do too. I had some help putting all these together, so uh, when you work two days a week, you can put ah, it on right? I mean, this is your presentation, so you can, you can cover whatever you need to. Yeah, I'll, 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 move, I'll move it all in. Make sure. This is, this is critical. You know somebody that's depressed, that meets these symptoms that you've looked at, they didn't get involved. Or if it's you, get involved in something, volunteer for something, get active. Now, that's almost counterintuitive. I'm so depressed I can't get out of bed. So how can I get active? Well, one step at a time. One foot out of bed at a time, that's how you do it. Make healthy choices. Sleep hygiene is critical, you know. I don't know about y'all, but I can't go home. Okay, I'll finish this, I'll get home about eight o'clock. I can't go home and go to bed. I have to, I have to wind down, I have to go through my ritual. And we all have separate rituals, good nutrition, Thinking, slow down, make a plan. How am I going to not feel so crappy? I'm going to say something else. I'm going to say crappy, okay? Uh, know that you're not perfect. A lot of these, these disorders, both anxiety, I think, and depression, we, we try so hard to be perfect. Well, I'm anything but. Okay? And all of y'all are too. Yeah. Perfect isn't English. Like, perfect is kind of like an image. It's like an unrealistic picture sure. that we set up. And then we do it, like, reach it, but it doesn't quite match up because reality is always chaotic. And mm -hmm. but, we, but we think we should be perfect sometimes. Yeah. And if we don't achieve that goal, then we can become depressed. Remember, too, I love this one. There's no normal. What's normal for you 
It may or may not be normal for me. This is my favorite one. We're going to talk about this one for about five, about maybe ten minutes. Complex situation condition where there's uncontrolled use of a substance despite harmful consequences. And that key thing is a substance. That can be alcohol. See that a lot on college campuses. It can be marijuana. See that a lot on college campuses. Don't see so much of the, I know it's out there. But don't see so many presenting with cocaine, mollies, benzo. Science, a few, few years ago, there was a big benzo. Uh, maybe still going on, Xanax outbreak. Talk to one student one day. How many Xanax you take? I don't know, a handful. Whoa. Time out. You need to be awesome. What is one drink? If I'm going to have a drink, what is one drink? Beer. Huh? Beer. How big a beer? A can. 20 ounces. A can? 16 ounces. 12 ounces. Now, do y'all still use red solo cups? Oh, yeah. Okay. I can go get me a to the keg. Hey, we did this. I did this. I'm not picking on y'all. I'm talking about me. I'd go to the keg and I'd fill up that solo cup, which is about 18 to 24 ounces, which means I had one to two beers. But to all my buddies, guess what? I had one beer because I had one cup full. We have to be careful with that. How much whiskey is in one drink? 1.5 ounces. 1.5 ounces, that's right. Now, how many of us when we're at a party and here's my gin and my vodka and all of that, how many of us use a jigger? A jigger, a shot glass. Oh, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I'm on it. Oh, hey, just pour it in. There. That's All enough. right, that's enough. There may be two or three drinks in there, but guess what? My red solo cup said I had one drink. It's dangerous. It's dangerous. Talk about me. Wine? How much wine? Two. Yeah, I think we can afford that. A whole box. I'm sorry. It used to be, now they're saying five ounces of wine. Not in glass. Not that solo cup. How much is in there? Trust me, it's more than four ounces. I love your eyeball, man. I love that. <laughs> and uh, malt liquor. We don't. Y'all don't probably don't see do that a lot. Eight or nine ounces. The key thing is to know what we're doing. Now, get, don't get me wrong. I don't expect y'all to go out and start getting the shot glass and measure people's thing. But you need to think about it. You need to think about it. How much drink, for us guys, how many drinks a day is considered heavy drinking? Huh? More than five to two hours. Depends on what well, that's, you're That's binge drinking. That's a little bit different. Uh, depends four. on the okay. <laughs> how, how much is it for women? Three. Two. Why would it be different? That's part of it. It's our size. But also, they have less alcohol dehydrogenase, if I said that right, in their gut, and that's what metabolizes alcohol. So, Kind of at a quote for this event. Binge drinking, you get it right, five drinks in two hours. How many of us binge drink? Come on. You go to a party. You go to a party at seven o'clock. You don't want to hang out sipping till nine to get a buzz. No, what was the question? How many of you binge drink? Oh. We all did. Absolutely. Binge drinking is the most dangerous type of drinking. After I binge drink, I have my five drinks in two hours. On average, my blood alcohol level is going to be 0.08. That's drunk, whether we feel it or not. Now, many of us, and I don't drink anymore. I've been, I, I quit drinking about 10 years ago. Hadn't touched a drop. But how many of us are sitting there thinking, wow, I had five drinks and I didn't really feel it. 
I really didn't feel like I was, quote, that messed up. I didn't feel, quote, drunk. Why? Why? Because we're developing tolerance. And tolerance is the beginning of physical dependency of alcohol. Please understand, I'm not getting up here saying, I'm not a teetotaler, but I'm an educator. You need to know this stuff, because you're going to do it. Your college, your fraternity, you go to football games, you have parties, blah, 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 blah. Now, why is it, okay, we're going to shift over to good old weed. Can people become addicted to marijuana? Yes. Yes. And we know that because why? We know people that are. We know that clinically because they're withdrawal symptoms. Yes. And I hadn't met too many weed smokers that's going to go out and knock you over the head, rip you off for $5 to buy whatever <laughs> amount of weed that has. I quit that about 30 years ago. Is that about half a gram now? See, back in my days, $5, yeah, you know, get, get you about a half an ounce. But anyway, there's, <laughs> there's withdrawal symptoms with marijuana. If I'm a regular smoker and I quit, and regular smoker, I'm now smoking daily, okay? And yes, we got college students to smoke daily. And I quit, I'm going to have nervousness, I'm going to have an appetite disturbance, I'm going to be irritable, and my sleep's going to be all screwed up. And that's going to last seven to ten days. On about day five, most students that I know are going to go get another joint, or a head, or whatever y'all get, a dab, or whatever, because they feel so miserable. Okay? My opinion on marijuana and T or THC, however you want to call it, is that it's not a cure-all. You know, right now you got THC and DVD oils and blah 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 that's going to cure everything. That's not the case. Nor is it the devil's drug. Okay, it's somewhere in between. Those Marijuana you guys have at your age is different from mine because of THC content. Very different. Very different drug. So why is it that some people, we're going to use a continuum, some people start here just having a good time and some people end up as an addict. Why? How does that happen? The best explanation I have of that progression is as follows. We learn the mood swing. Think back, first time you drank, or first time you smoked, you did it, chances are nothing bad happened, and you went home, and all was cool. Me, first time I drank, I had, y'all get this now, one and a half hot Miller High Lives in the heat of the summer in Alabama. Okay. <laughs> I drank, I went home, nothing bad happened. When I first smoked weed, I went out, smoked my weed, hung out with my friends, laughed a lot, had a munchies, went home, and what? Nothing bad. So I'm learning right now what? I'm learning I can trust the substance. I'm learning I can go out, I can drink, or I can smoke, and nothing bad's gonna happen, and I'm gonna go home. That's true with most of us. Occasionally, there's gonna be somebody that's gonna get busted the first time. I mean, that, that's just happened, okay? Uh, we have a degree of control here, of the mood swings. I know that if I drink one and a half hot beers in the summer, I'm gonna feel pretty miserable because it's a horrible taste. But I know what to expect. And while we're learning it, we find out, like I said, nothing bad happened. Nobody went crazy. Nobody 
everybody was hospitalized. Then we get to where we seek that mood swing. Now I'm looking to get high. I'm looking to go out and drink and have a few drinks and get a good buzz. Why? Because I trust it. I know that I can do that. It's on my to-do list. The key here is I'm doing it at appropriate times and places. Now, a caveat. If you're under 21 and you're drinking, you are at risk for what? Minor consumption. You are at risk. No matter what your age, if, if you've got some weed on you and you get busted, you're busted. So I'm not saying go do these things. Okay? That's my legal disclaimer. <laughs> yeah, okay. So I'm not saying that. Uh, but appropriate times and places. We got a big football game, we got a big party, appropriate time and place. I got a final exam tomorrow morning and I'm gonna go to Brothers tonight. That's not appropriate time and place. Okay? So while we're seeking the moose wing, we do that. We have rules. I can control this. I'm gonna go out tonight and and, and drink two or three two or three beers with my friends and I saw my drink. And I can control it. Do I ever get a hangover? Sure. There's occasional misuse here. The bottom line, this is where social drinkers stand. That's a social drinker right there. I couldn't be one. A lot of people can. But any of us here that drink, we're on that continuum. We're somewhere on that continuum. The next phase is harmful dependency. This is where things start going bad. Uh, we lose control. I'm gonna go out and drink two or three beers and drink six. Or I'm gonna go out and just, uh, I'm only gonna take a couple of hits off the bomb pipe and I burn it up, okay? I, I'm starting to lose control. I'm only gonna do two or three lines of cocaine and I end up punching $100 out. And, uh, what, and where does that go? So, and it's not a good thing. We start becoming preoccupied about using. What does that mean? I'm going through my day and that's all I'm thinking about. I'm only thinking about wanting to get high. I'm only thinking about wanting to catch that buzz. I set rules up for myself trying to get control and I break my own rules. That leads to more more use. Because now what? Now I'm depressed. I'm no good. I can't I can't control my own rules. Blah blah blah. So I, what do I do? I drink more. There's increased tolerance. We talked about tolerance already, right? When I first started drinking, I that beer and a half, I got me a little buds. When I quit drinking, it took me twelve. Okay, and that's just that tolerance that increased. Okay. It's during this phase that there's starting to be that deterioration in our life. The final stage, what we were seeking, learning the mood swing, we're seeking it, now harmful dependency. The final stage is we use so we can feel normal. How many of you know people that are addicts and or alcoholics? When you reach that stage of use, why are they using? They want to feel normal. Everyone I've talked to sitting in the jail, sitting in the hospital, talking to them right before, the night before they die, they just want to be normal. Addiction is pain across the line. I, Exam okay, I'm a heroin addict. I never, I, I've done my share, but I was never addicted. But now let's just say I'm not going to pick on y'all because this is too intense. Now I'm an addict. Now I'm in jail. Now I'm going through withdrawals and I'm sweating and I'm puking and I, everything in the world's uncomfortable. Why do I want to use? Not to get high, to feel normal. Same thing with alcohol. I got the shakes. I can't do anything. I just want to drink. So I want to quit shaking. 
That is addiction. We start having blackouts more frequent. What's a blackout, y'all? A lapse in memory. Huh? A lapse in memory. That never comes back. Mm -hmm. We can all have a lapse in memory. But you have a blackout from 8 o'clock tonight till tomorrow morning, you're never going to put the pieces together. No matter me or your brothers come and say, well, you remember this, 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 this. You don't. You don't. The most extreme case I had, I'm going to hurry up here, uh, is um, he was retired, sergeant major, uh, alcoholic, went to uh, Florida for four days, came back, didn't know he'd been there until he got his credit card bills. What the hell happened here? Somebody took my card? No, it's in my pocket. Blackout. We use this. This is a valid test, scientific, and all that kind of stuff. Easy. If you ever felt need to cut down, I did. I didn't do anything about it, but I felt like I should. Uh, did you get? Do you get annoyed when people criticize your drink or drug use? Well, you drink too much. Yeah, that pissed me off. Okay. Uh, have you ever felt guilty? about anything that happened when you were drinking or drugging. Yeah, maybe I did. Have you ever felt you needed a drink first thing in the morning or to steady your nerves? Hey, I was a dude that would go to Lowe's at 7 o'clock and on the way home hit a six pack. Okay? Two, this says one, that's a possible problem. Two's a definite problem. Do something about it. Y'all are looking up there. You're looking at that. You're going over that questionnaire in your mind. There's one or two. Call me. Let's do something about it. <laughs> Suicide prevention. This is critical. Talking with a student today. I can't give out any names, but he had a friend back home that called him not long ago that says, Hey, I'm not going to wake up in the morning. This dude called the police saved her life. Don't be afraid to intervene. He got a call from the girl's parents that says, thank you. Don't be afraid to intervene. Don't be afraid to say, hey, are you thinking about killing yourself? It's okay to use those words. It's okay to use the word suicide. We know that. Suicide is complex. There's risk factors. Never going to change. Red flag. It's not sadness now. We're talking about something more severe. If I'm a drinker or a druggie, my use is going to go up. I'm going to withdraw. I'm going to start giving away my stuff. Hey, you love my albums. Here's, here's my music. You love my phone. Here's my phone. You like this. Here it is. I start getting rid of stuff. Get some, get some ready. What you want to do with suicide is ask, are you thinking about killing yourself? You want to keep them safe. If they've got a gun, get it. I had a good friend of mine that had dementia, and he was going to kill everybody and himself. So what did we do? We got all his weapons out of the house. Be with them. Acknowledge the pain. Acknowledge the feelings. And help them connect. That's similar to what this is. More, all of this we're talking about is more than just a bad day. We can help. Half of us going to have a mental health issue. Don't mean we're going to have to have hospitalized, blah, 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 but we are. Uh, validate, appreciate, and refer. By that, I mean and this comes from active minds. Well, validate, simply speaking, validate the feelings. It's okay that you feel this way, that's normal. Uh, appreciate, I, I appreciate where you are, I understand. I may not understand where you are, but, but it's normal, it's good, it's okay, I appreciate that. And refer them. Get, get them somewhere. Now here on campus, we got us, UPD, this thing's not building anymore. 
Let's see. I don't know why it, it just kind of ended on me. Okay, validate. Let them know. Appreciate they're doing the right thing. Let them know helps available. Treatable resources, national crisis hotline, etc. Uh, if you have a, a friend or colleague on campus that you think is suicidal, call us. If it's at night, call UPD. Okay. Uh, there's so much more I want to say, but uh, we're about out of time. And, uh, this this website has some information. We've talked about that. That's me. And I know I'm I'm out of time. Yes, sir. I just wanted to ask. Y'all know the difference between sympathy and empathy, right? Sympathy is whenever. Like saying, oh, that sucks. Well, sympathy is whenever you like you something, they have pain going through the same thing, so you. Uh, that's that's sympathy. That's a, well, no, well, that empathy is whenever. Empathy is being able to understand the shoes. Yeah. Relate to what they. And when you're talking with somebody who's depressed or might be suicidal, it's very important to be sympathetic or sorry, empathetic with them. You don't want to segue it in that any way because if you start bringing yourself into it, you know, saying like, okay. yeah, that sucks, you know, but that's not happening to me, whatever, they're going to think that yeah. you don't care. Mm -hmm. um, Good point. Also not asking them why questions. Yeah. That's something I learned because uh, I've worked in psych a couple times. Right, right, right then in yeah. that moment, it don't matter why. Yeah. Now, later all on, that does treatment well yeah. makes them I'm sorry. Like they need to defend themselves. Because Asking why questions. Yeah, later on, <clears throat> if, if this was a gesture or attempt and they survive, later on we want to know why. But not right then. Yeah. Why is not important? So, in a like, kind of offshoot, but in a similar way, um, if somebody's ever like heated or like not feeling well and these are room for people, if you call them, this is happening to me. Mm -hmm. If you call me and ask the first, the first question you ask is, where are you? I don't want to tell you. That is the last thing I want to tell you because I want to get away from that situation. So, like, I think that's probably what they're trying not to focus on is why it's happening. You just have to focus on, are you okay to begin with and try to get them to calm down and then you can find the reasoning about it later on. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You're talking about process intervention. Really. Yeah, and like what he was talking about earlier, like with the, anxiety disorder stuff. Mm -hmm. Like I I had zero mental health problems for eighteen years mm -hmm. of my life. So anytime we had these type of meetings I would a lot of it would go right over my head because I really couldn't relate to any of it. But then I was nineteen years old and everything kinda of shit me in, in the face uh, and I realized that like, that stuff does happen where you you're you're in a room and you're doing just fine and all of a sudden you're not. Yeah. And you're like, I have to leave. I don't feel right. Mm -hmm. And like like you were saying, asking why, you don't know why. And it makes you frustrated. Because you're like, why can I never go to class? Why can I not get up and talk to people? Like, it makes you mad on the inside, yeah. speaking from a personal point of view. So like, try to be mindful of that. Because again, yeah, 18 years of my life, I had no idea people went through that on the daily. And, that, and, and we do as people, we do. And, and don't, back to the substance abuse. If somebody's sick and puking their guts out and, and their respirations are down and they're starting to turn blue, call the police. Mm -hmm. Call them. Are they going to arrest you if you're drinking? No. No. Call them. Yeah. Sa save There's, a life. There are laws connected to that. Huh? There are laws connected to that. Absolutely. Yeah. And there's school policies, too. Oh, okay. yeah. There's school policies. One, other, one final thing. If you think you have a problem, you probably do. I thought for a long time I had a drinking problem. Okay? Didn't do anything about it. Until I had to have three heart procedures in one day. And my cardiologist, who I, work, I, I, 